Hello, thank you and welcome for joining us for um, this panel on study abroad programs. Um, just to go over, um, we will, um, I'll introduce um, the panelists and myself, the moderator, and then we will start with a question and then open it up to questions that you might have for our students and for our parents who have so kindly um, volunteered to be up on the panel with us today. So I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I am Isabel Christ. I'm the Assistant Director in the Global Education Office and also um, point person for engineers who are interested in studying abroad. And then we've got here Julia. Actually, I think everybody's in, in order. Uh, Julia Winchell, who is one of our peer advisors and um, who spent spring 2019 um, at the University of New South Wales in Australia, and that was um, with our partner, um, Ifsa Butler. And next we have uh, Yuchi, okay. Bian, who's also one of our peer advisors um, and spent fall 2018 um, with DIS in Copenhagen. And you are, sorry, Julia, you're a medicine, health, and society major. And Yuchi, you are neuroscience and philosophy, unless that's changed. Um, so the, <laughs> and then we have uh, Cyan Baker, who um, is our volunteer uh, study abroad ambassador and um, spent fall 2018 um, at University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, and also with our partner, um, IFSA. And then we have uh, Mrs. Baker, who is Cyan's mom and um, I think was a great support um, and so thankful that you can join us here today. And then we have Mr. Gonsalves, whose daughter Emily participated in one of our Maymaster programs and she's in class, but he has agreed to be here today to uh, talk about that experience as well. So I'll just start off with one quick question for, um, for everybody, just to get us started. Um, so other than your classes, I believe each of you, the students, participated um, in experiential learning activities such as research and service. Could you share something about these experiences with our audience? Um, hi, everyone. Oh, sorry, that's really loud. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia again. Thank you all for coming. Um, so when I was in Sydney, Australia, I participated in clinical research. Um, so. I helped a research midwife work on a clinical trial investigating a new intervention for anemia in pregnancy. Um, so I worked in an antenatal clinic. A lot of it was observational. Um, I got to shadow a lot of doctors, a lot of midwives. Um, I recruited patients for the trial. I worked on data entry. And I also learned how to draw blood and work with human blood in the lab. Hi, I'm Yuchi. Um, I studied abroad in DIS, at DIS Copenhagen in Denmark, and I was in the medical practice uh, policy and uh, program, medical practice and policy program. And um, that class was taught by doctors, and so we had some uh, hands-on clinical experience too, where they taught us how to intubate a patient and um, put in IVs. So, and we also got to visit lots of hospitals in different countries and learn about their different healthcare systems. Hi everyone, um, I'm Cyan. I studied abroad in Christchurch, New Zealand, and um, for my experiential learning, uh, I got a chance to work with the student volunteer army at University of Canterbury, which was a student group that was um, created after the 2010 and 2011 earthquakes um, that really impacted uh, the Christchurch city. And so with Student Volunteer Army, I was able to help bridge the gap uh, between the University of Canterbury and uh, the local elementary school, Island Elementary. Um, and I was able to buy sports equipment for the elementary and then also host two field days. And the kids loved it so much. So they um, definitely were able to foster a relationship with the university students, which was great. Mrs. Baker, did you want to say something sort of as an introduction to your experience sending your daughter halfway across the world? Okay. Um, yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it definitely was an eye-awakening and a great opportunity. Um, I will say one of the main things of why we chose the university here was because of the study abroad opportunities. Um, and we actually worked through a lot of different things. She did a lot of work herself, I'll be honest with you. Um, but going through the steps and getting prepared for a study abroad, um, they make sure that the, uh, the students are getting credit for what they do when they go away. 
Um, I've heard some worse stories about where some youth are not getting the proper credit or extends out their time in college um, because of the fact they just didn't get the uh, exact credit they needed in order to stay on track for graduating, uh, graduation. Um, but other than that, I got a chance to go over and visit as well. Um, great experience from my end was to be able to see what exactly she was having the experience with and being able to um, do some of the things that um, she actually helped create and put in place and meet others who were studying abroad um, that she met all these wonderful um, individuals, individuals and relationships across the board there in um, Christ Church and also here in the States as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Don Gonsalves. Emily's uh, in class right now doing the hard work while I'm here. Um, her experience uh, was very favorable uh, in her May semester to London. She's an economics and math major, and obviously London would be one of the key locations to be, uh, as Tori indicated. Um, the university is really good with providing the support necessary, whether it be um, any type of funds, uh, logistical support, uh, also, um, with regards to the credits, so I mean, she was in, in London uh, in a class uh, labeled the Economics of War um, that provided her three credits, which were very valuable from the perspective that she was able to learn on a topic that was relevant to her major, but also um, able to experience a city and, and culture that uh, that she was very much interested in. Um, it was at the time that. Uh, the royal wedding was taking place, so I guess that was a bonus. But, uh, but in addition to all that, uh, living in Kensington, um, uh, learning through the Foundation of International Education and also uh, um, the uh, curriculum, uh, which allowed for her to um, um, look at it from, from not only from the American but from the European perspective, the, the impact of war, uh, especially World War II. They ended up... Uh, uh, also visiting the site of Normandy, which uh, was very relevant to, to the, the class. So overall, a, a very favorable experience. I think from a parent's perspective, uh, when you, especially when you start at the freshman uh, point in, in your child's career, is to really take a long, hard look at your calendar and don't only look at it for, you know, from a perspective of like, you know, what's going on over the next uh, 10 to 12 months. You really need to look at the, the four-year calendar and plan things out because there's so much different um, challenges on time and, and perspective um, from an internship perspective. What are you going to do in May? Uh, if you're not doing a May semester, or would you like to go ahead and do a semester abroad? So uh, you really uh, need to start right away um, planning uh, the calendar for the next four years if you, if you have, haven't done that as of yet, or the next couple of years that you have. So that's my, the, my biggest recommendation. Okay, thank you. I also want to take a quick moment to introduce my colleagues um, here from the Global Education Office. I have our newest um, second week, uh, Tyler Walker, um, who's one of our study abroad advisors. And over here I have Caitlin Slotnick, who is also one of our study abroad advisors and our outreach coordinator. She organized this, so thank you. Um, in the back over here, I have Dave Brown, um, one of our advisors, and also um, our agreements coordinator, and then Susie Wong in the back, and she is also an advisor and works with our incoming exchange students and on the May Mester application cycle so that I don't have to do it. Thank you. All right, so I'd like to open this up for questions. We have microphones, so if anybody have any questions for the panel. Hi. Um, I'm under the impression, maybe I'm mistaken, that Vanderbilt. There it is. That Vanderbilt well, doesn't have its own study abroad programs in different locations, right? That you go through other universities? study abroad programs? So, Is that the way it works? So we don't have our own center. Um, right. We did um, for a, a while, but only a very small number. So it's easier for us as a smaller office um, and as a university to partner with organizations who have the staff on the ground. So we do have a lot of programs through what we call third-party providers, um, which actually 
both Julia and Asayan, um, they were uh, with IFSA. And then the DIS program is um, it's, its own standalone institute in Copenhagen. Um, so we do have um, a variety of program types, but we do work with partners. Okay, because when you say they, partners, you mean other universities not in the just, United States and also pla other places abroad? Right, so it's a variety. So okay. some, some like DIS, it's its own institute. Mm -hmm. um, with IFSA, they're sort of the middleman between Vanderbilt and the host university. So it's still direct enroll, but you have the benefit of having the IFSA staff on the ground, the resident directors and um, advisors on the ground as well. So we have a variety. And then we have direct exchanges where we have students coming here, and then our students are going there directly. And so there's a little less support there, but um, still wonderful programs. And again, it's a variety. And then some will have center courses and direct enrollment courses in the same program. So it's a variety of options. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we've got one oh, sure. of her. Thank you. Hello. Mine is for the girls. Yeah. Um, have any of you been to those locations previously? And I guess in general for the study abroad program, do you find it beneficial for the kids to go if they've already been there? Like if our son has already been to Spain twice, is there a reason for him to go again? And for engineering, like that's not gonna happen for him this year. Does he need to wait until next year? Um, so before I went abroad, I had never been to Australia before, but I always, for my entire life, knew that it was a place I always wanted to visit. Um, as for whether or not it's important to go somewhere new or go somewhere you've been before, um, I think that's really up to the student. There's no real set in stone answer for that. It's really if he loves Spain and he wants to go back and spend a semester or a, or a year or a month or whatever there, um, then that's up to him. Um, but if he wants to see a new place, that's great too, to just to immerse himself in a new culture. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience in which I had never been to Europe at all before, um, never lost the Copenhagen, so it was a great chance for me to, during the semester, travel to different countries and explore um, you know, so many different cultures. But I think also the experience that you get from a country is different um, if you're a tourist versus if you're living there. So if he does uh, decide to spend a semester or a year there, that might be a different experience for him, especially if he already loves the country. Um, I would definitely like to re uh, reiterate that. Um, I had never been to New Zealand before, um, and actually I didn't even have that on my list. I just walked into GEO one day and was like, give me a list of places I can go as a civil engineer. Um, and I kind of just like narrowed down my options and ended up with New Zealand, and I'm happy that I did go somewhere that I hadn't been before. But I've also done a May semester. Um, this past May, I actually went to the UK, and um, I was able to return to London um, and get a chance to explore being there for a longer period of time. Um, and I think it was beneficial for me to go back because the first time that I went to London, I was there for like three days. Um, and the second time going back, spending a month traveling around the UK, um, also looking at it from the theater lens um, instead of from an engineering lens or a tourist pers uh, perspective was um, very rewarding and helped me grow uh, culturally. Uh, and I'll add for the engineering, when you go depends on your major and what courses you need to take. So Cyan is a civil engineer and was going abroad in her junior year and then sort of shortly, she had a short turnaround time between, I told her, you can only go in the fall. Um, and so we, we worked that out. And so for civil engineers, the, the reason that, that fall works um, is because in the spring, they have to take structural design. And that involves learning codes. And you need to learn US codes if you're going to be working in the US. So she went abroad and actually did our structural analysis course. Um, she followed the Vanderbilt course while she was abroad. So distance learning um, with Vanderbilt. So that was something that civil engineering was able to put in place to make it easier for the civil engineers to study abroad, but in the fall. Because she had been thinking spring. <laughs> Hi. I'd just like to clarify something. Um, the first two young ladies on the panel talked a lot about hands-on experience, and it was almost to me like an internship. Yet the gentleman, the dad on the end, talked about actual study work. So are some internships geared more towards study and others towards hands-on experience? 
I'll let the panelists answer that because I think they'll do a good job. Yeah, so I talked about getting some clinical experience, but that was just a very small part of uh, what my experience was. So um, I took five classes while I was abroad, uh, two or three with at the study center at DIS, and then two where DIS helped me get into two classes with the University of Copenhagen. So I was definitely in an academic environment. Um, and the clinical experiences I was talking about was an extension of my main core class, which is something that's specific to the DIS program. But it helped us um, supplement our learning that we were also doing in the classroom. But definitely there was a good balance of both. And um, I learned a lot in the classroom too. Um, I'm in kind of a similar boat, so I also took classes. The research that I did at the hospital um, was unrelated to the classes because I didn't get credit for it. Um, it was more of an extracurricular volunteer kind of thing that I just wanted to add on to my study abroad experience. Um, I want to go into public health eventually, so to do research in a different country was really important to me. Um, and it just helped boost my resume and get me a letter of recommendation for graduate school and things like that. Um, but I took classes and had an academic experience in addition to that. Thank you. Typically, how many credit hours does a uh, study abroad carry? It's usually between 14 and 16, but it really depends on the program. Sometimes it'll be more. I had two questions for the panelists. When is the best time in your four-year uh, trajectory to study abroad? And uh, two, does it depend on which major you're going into to decide where you're going to go? So I'm pre-med um, and I went abroad my junior fall and the reason I made that decision was partly because of planning for med school but partly because of my majors. Um, I knew I was going abroad in the spring, uh, I was going to go abroad in uh, junior year because I had to take organic chemistry and biology during my sophomore year. Um, and the reason why I decided to go in the fall instead of the spring was because I wanted to give myself time to take the MCAT in the spring in case I wanted to apply. Uh, directly. And uh, for other reasons, I decided to postpone my MCAT, but I gave myself the opportunity to come back and study if I needed to and still be able to apply on time. Um, so I am also pre-med, so I had to take those prereqs during my sophomore year, so that's why I knew I was going my junior year. Um, I knew that I'm taking a few gap years before med school, so I wasn't really worried about coming back and taking the MCAT right away. Um, but I decided to go in the spring of my junior year because I I'm a transfer student and I came here as a sophomore after completing my freshman year elsewhere. Um, so I just wanted that extra semester, my junior fall here on campus, just to meet some more of my peers. Um, and for the case of a civil engineer, um, like it's already been stated, uh, the fall of your junior year is usually the best time to go abroad. Um, but also other engineering students have uh, different requirements. So I know a few mecha uh, mechanical engineers who went abroad in the fall, but most went abroad in the spring of their junior year. Um, it really just depends on your schedule, especially for engineering, since our schedule is laid out from freshman year all the way through senior year. Um, so we have a little bit easier of a time like figuring out when to study abroad and also you can um, talk to GEO to help you um, decide on that. And for the location of the study abroad programs, yes, your major definitely uh, makes a difference on that. So for engineering, especially civil engineering, I only had about four options and then, um, well, I had more than four, but uh, based on your GPA, that also makes a difference on where you can go. Um, and so when narrowing down from my GPA, I had about like four to five options and then looking at the credits that I received at like each university, um, that narrowed it down even more. Um, Ireland was actually my top choice, but I ended up not going to Ireland because of the weird way that the credits um, would have transferred over for all of the courses that I need to take. So. Can you talk a little bit about the timing for the application process for um, the study abroad programs? If a student is interested in studying abroad in the fall of next year, when would they start the application process? How does that work? 
So um, the applications for fall term are due in early to mid-February uh, prior, and the application um, applications open, I think for these, they were probably open in November. Um, we're shooting for October this year, um, depending on, on how quickly we can you know, get taken care of our, because we have a lot of interest in spring and we have a huge imbalance right now of students going in the fall. Fall is often a better option for students in many ways, but the mindset is spring, except for I, we have two fall representatives on the panel. Um, so it will usually be then, and then if you're going f in the um, spring, the deadlines, there are two deadlines, an early deadline and the regular deadline, and those are gonna be early September for the early deadline and mid-September for the regular deadline for spring programs. So we have a lot, it's a lot more compressed, a lot less time for figuring out you know, visas and, and doing that. So that's why sometimes the fall gives you a little bit more time to sort things out. It just, again, it just depends on the student and what works best. We tend to focus in our advising what's the best academic fit. And then if everything's equal, then we look and see what other interests the student has to make sure that they're finding a program that best meets the holistic needs and the wants that they have. This is piggybacking on some of the other questions as well. So, and we are a few minutes late, I apologize. So you have a spring, a, a fall offering, a spring offering, a May master, and a summer option? Is there a summer option? Correct. I missed that. So we do have summer options. We don't have that many. Um, we, so for all of our programs, we do charge Vanderbilt tuition. Vanderbilt financial aid applies to our semester programs. Um, it does not apply to May master or summer. There is a competitive scholarship that students can apply for to receive funding to assist with the cost of May, Mester, and Summer. But because we're charging Vanderbilt tuition, Summer can get very expensive. Sure. So, you know, as a, as a first-time freshman, what do we encourage our student to do? Do we encourage them to come see you guys now to sort of plan for the future? Is it too soon? What are you... I, I, I just, I always say it's never too early. How early did you guys start? I always knew that I, um, I always knew that I wanted to go study abroad, uh, but I didn't finalize my major until my sophomore year. Um, so what I, I think I started making decisions the summer after my freshman year. Um, and I wasn't completely sure about my major then, but I made, uh, possible four-year plans for my possible majors um, to try and plan out what my next three years. So that, that, that took a lot of planning, um, but I think it helped me because regardless of what path I chose to take, I knew that I could set out that semester and I knew what classes Okay, I we have a son. <laughs> and I, and I, what, what, what do you mean? And, and he is at Vanderbilt, so kudos, but... <laughs> I'm just looking for ways to encourage him to make sure he doesn't miss the boat. <laughs> so maybe he needs to come see us. <laughs> Got it. Um, hi. I just wanted to say first, thank you very much. My daughter participated in Maymester this last summer in Spain, and she loved it. And for everybody else, she got one of the competitive scholarships. So thank you again, Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, But I had a, two kind of wonky questions. One is my daughter is a dual citizen, and she wants to go for a semester abroad. Is she going to need to get a different visa, or how will that? If she goes to an EU country, she's an EU citizen. She, if she, if she is an EU citizen and has a current EU passport, yes, she should not need a visa to go. Okay, but she will have to remember to travel in and out with her her American passport, yes. with her European passport. Oh, okay. Um, second question is. Um, so she's looking at the CIEE program in Barcelona, and I noticed there were three. So is there, what's the difference between advanced liberal arts and liberal arts? Dave, would you like to take that one? Uh, it's probably easier to talk in person. Okay. Okay, thank you. We also have other programs in Spain, just, yeah. 
I had a question for the panelists about their living situations, if they had homestay or dormitory or regular apartment. Um, so for University of Canterbury, um, all of their students besides the freshmen live off campus. Um, only the freshmen have uh, dorms. So my living situation was um, Islam Apartments. And uh, that was an apartment uh, that was a mixture of students that were either studying abroad or were international students. Um, and we also had a few Kiwi students who also lived with us. Um, so it was a five-person apartment and everyone had their own single. The only shared spaces were the two bathrooms and our living room and kitchen. Um, and so with that, um, I didn't even have to actually try to seek out housing arrangement. If the butler was able to do that for me um, and it was included in my cost um, for the program. Yeah, I also lived in program provided housing. I lived in a living learning community uh, and it was focused around uh, Danish cuisine. So we got to learn how to cook some stuff. But um, I, was I was living with American students, but that's not the only uh, living option that's available in Copenhagen. There's also homestay and um, apartment style, sort of like what she was mentioning earlier, like where you're living with uh, Danish students. Um, and then there's other types of housing where you can live with American students. So there's a wide variety. Um, so at UNSW, I also lived in a dorm on campus. Um, I lived in the international dorm. So there were a few study abroad students, other Americans, um, but the majority of the students living there were Australian full-time students or students from a bunch of countries in Asia or you know other students who are full-time at UNSW. The, the housing options depend on the program, so they vary. Uh, so my question is, I have a freshman and he's a public policy, well, he said he would like to double major public policy econ. And so it's sort of a heavy course load and that makes him wonder when study abroad might fit. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether people use study abroad sometimes to take coursework in their Axel courses. Ah, our, our, and he's an arts and science student? Okay, so anybody who does not have an arts and science student, don't listen to this part, because it's more flexible for your students. For arts and science, Axel, um, the student, the courses they take abroad, the individual courses will not count for Axel. Um, but by studying abroad on a program of six credits or more, one of our programs, that counts as one INT, so the international. Um, so that means that just by studying abroad, they'll be able to satisfy one of those. They wouldn't have to take an additional course for that. I think you have to have three INTs. But for everybody else, not ANS, the, the, it's more flexible because you can, um, for the liberal ed core, for each of the Blair, Peabody, and engineering, you can petition to substitute um, requirements. Um, so. So it's, it's different, but, but ANS is, if it's not taught by a Vanderbilt professor, then it doesn't count for Axel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, our daughter went over to Russia for a May Mester, had a fantastic time, um, is interested in going back to Russia for a semester, changing political climate. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about safety and security and the role that Vanderbilt plays with the third party um, in terms of keeping in communication with family and the students. Okay, so um, she's not here right now because she's on um, maternity leave, but Vanderbilt does have the Global Safety and Security Manager. Her name is Andrea Bordeaux, and we work very closely with her. So um, she is the one that looks at the security situation and safety situation in our locations and works very closely with her colleagues in our programs um, to ensure that we are, um, you know, paying attention to the situation on the ground, and we closely monitor. So when we had, ish, you know, we had the protests in Hong Kong, we didn't have any students there, but she was still monitoring that um, because we may have students going in the spring. So, so that is something that Vanderbilt has um, that um, is a very important role, and she does wonderful work. Um, we also have the Vanderbilt, um, what is it, Incident for Travel, VERT, Vanderbilt. Can anybody remember the whole, but anyway, VERT. So that's the emergency number that you can call 
Um, our students can call VERT. Um, it goes to RVUPD, and once they realize it's one of our students who is abroad, then that goes to the VERT team to uh, triage and to answer accordingly. Um, so you have a smaller team that's working on that, making the response a lot more efficient. So we, we do actively monitor and we do work with our program providers, many of whom have uh, people in similar positions, um, and they're often CIEE, which does have a program in Russia, is one of those, so she works with her colleagues um, at CIEE and IFSA and, and other partners as well. So. So uh, my question is for the gentleman whose daughter went to the Maymester. When, what year did your daughter um, go? Where, what kind of dorming situation was that, and when did you have to apply for it? She went from uh, in between her sophomore to junior year, and um, she pretty much started the whole process um, somewhere around October or so when she was applying. Um, so she already had the sense that she wanted to uh, identify London because, of, once again, she was an economics major, so that kind of fit in nicely. Um, the conditions there were fairly good. She was in, in um, Hyde Park um, the, through a program that's uh, referred to as the Foundation for International Education, I believe. Um, they're a partner to Vanderbilt, and uh, from what I understand, the dormitory, dormitory conditions were fairly nice. So, and she was essentially in the heart of, uh, of London. So it was uh, a very positive experience for her. I think I have this on, there we go. Um, thank you all for doing this. Uh, my daughter's a freshman, and like a lot of Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt students, she's got a lot of plans. She wants to double major, she wants to intern, she wants to study abroad. Uh, I like the sound of a four-year plan, but who does she start with? Does she start with an advisor? Because it's more with the, the interning and the double major. Who, who does she need to be talking to to get that four-year plan made? So we, we generally say they should start with their academic advisor, but if they, ha they know that there are certain things they want to accomplish during their time at Vanderbilt, whether it's study abroad um, or finding research opportunities, um, you know, I would say that it's reaching out to the different offices, but I would start with the academic advisor who will likely have resources to point your daughter to. But I'll also ask here if you, any of you, um, what other activities you've done on campus that, wait, intern, what was else, what else? Double major, intern, and study abroad. Okay, double major. Yeah, yeah, I'm a um, neuroscience and philosophy double major, so I think I have one class that overlaps for both majors. Um, and sort of what I did was I spent a lot of time online looking at the major requirements for both of them and um, sort of getting a general idea of which year um, I needed to take them and which semesters they were offered. You can sort of look at that with like past semesters on yes, like seeing which classes are offered when. Um, but Doing that, I also met with my academic advisors, um, and I spent a lot of time on the Axel page, uh, just making sure I would get my Axel requirements. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of how I organized it. And then um, for internships, I felt like it didn't really uh, uh, studying abroad didn't interfere with that at all because I did a semester uh, of a summer of research internship right before I went abroad. So. Um, yeah, those are, I didn't feel like those overlapped at all, but I know sometimes for like Australia, I don't know if that does. Yeah. I mean, uh, so when I went to Australia, I did an early start, early depart program. So I went right after New Year's and got back in May. So I had enough time to have an internship the summer after I got back. Um, but some people who go to Australia and New Zealand, I think, start in February and come back late June or July. Um, so that does impact whether or not you can get a summer internship. Um, but if studying abroad is super important to your daughter, daughter, um, then it's definitely something she could do or look into the early start, early depart. Um, for internships, yeah, uh, studying abroad didn't really drastically impact me. Um, so I uh, went abroad in the fall, and so New Zealand's um, semester starts in July. 
And um, with that, I had an internship right before leaving, so I started for a month. I communicated with my internship that I would be going abroad, and they fully supported it. And I even asked if I could come back to work with them during the winter break. And um, they said yes, so I came back mid-November and worked with them from mid-November to uh, returning back to Vanderbilt. Um, and yeah, that was like the same case for uh, pretty much like any study abroad experience as well. I also did a May semester, and um, that was the same school year technically. Um, and so with that, once again, I communicated to my internship that I would be going abroad, and so they were able to push my start time back until June first. Um, so, yeah. oh, and also to piggyback um, back to the May semester question about housing. Um, it isn't always uh, like student housing, which I wish it was. Um, for my case, I actually stayed in hotels everywhere we went, um, but those hotel fees were covered by our program fees for Vanderbilt. Um, and so that was um, worked into our tuition and fees. And so um, each location has a different situation depending on who the professor is and um, what the setup is for that. So I know one of my friends, she went to Cuba for her May semester and um, their living situation was much different from ours in the UK. Um, so that's just another thing to look into when you're looking at different study abroad programs. Do you think uh, the study abroad or May semester programs, are they affected if you want to participate in extracurricular activities or take a leadership role um, as a student? Um, because I know this, impacted my daughter's um, decision. Uh, she did a May semester uh, at the end of her sophomore year and she wanted to take a leadership role. So do you think um, that it has, you know, impact or is it relevant to talk about at all? Because I, I know it impacted her. Um, for me, studying abroad actually helped my applications um, for leadership um, positions around campus. Um, I joined an executive board the semester after coming back from abroad um, versus like I wasn't on any exec boards before going abroad. Um, so it definitely was a plus because it shows that you're open to learning more about um, other communities and other cultures, which is very helpful for being a leader um, in any organization. Um, and that's the same case with uh, job applications, grad school applications. It's all a very beneficial um, part of the application process. So, yeah. Um, at the time I was going abroad, I was considering two leadership positions, one that I was already in and one that I was hoping to apply to. And uh, the second one that I uh, wasn't yet in that position, I decided to hold off on applying because I was going abroad in the fall and um, the position required me to be there for recruitment purposes, which all happen in the fall um, for that organization. So I am now in that position as a senior, but uh, during my junior year, I did hold off. And then as for the position I previously held, um, someone else took over my spot in the fall, but then I just came back to it in the spring. So I think it differs by the organization, but sometimes it does interfere, but you can sometimes work that out with the organization. Um, yeah, just as for extracurricular organizations it more generally, not so much leadership positions. Obviously, it varies from organization to organization, but for the most part, as long as you communicate with the executive board and the rest of the members of that club um, that you will not be on campus for a semester or for a certain time, um, they will let you continue your membership after once you return. Study abroad does not have to be related to your specific major, especially in the May or summer. You have a lot more flexibility. But um, for if she won't, if she wants that to work for immersion, uh, she will want to talk to the Office of Immersion Resources. How many credits? Yes. All May are one three-credit course. 
So a Maymester, it's less a program, it's a course that has an abroad component. There are Maymesters that are strictly on campus, and those are not the ones that we process through our office. Um, but the ones with the abroad component, we manage the application process, or actually Susie does. But those are all faculty-led, um, and so it's a, it's a different, it's a slightly different model. It's a course that has an abroad component. Just uh, wanted to say, um, considering for the Maymester, um, my daughter didn't actually mention this, but um, the courses she took from Maymester, as some had heard, it was theater. It was a, um, not actually an engineering um, component, but it satisfied a um, the liberal arts core. Thank you. I appreciate it. It set a, satisfied that, and um, actually, it had led her to be able to do a minor in business uh, for business management for engineering. That one course opened up enough credit for her to be able to do the additional classes, although she will be taking 18 credit hours for this semester and the spring, <laughs> but she's coming out with a major and a minor. <laughs> Just, just kind of get that out there as a, a, a one of those things. So if, even if it's something that they want to do um, in hopes that they will line up to something, they'll definitely get a credit for it, or they'll have a lifetime of experience with it for sure. Because when they come back, they have more things to talk about. And I will say this, um, yes, study abroad um, is not just only pivotal for the youth, I say that definitely, if you didn't have it, you're still gonna be fine looking for a job opportunity, but having that experience and the knowledge, even if you went for the educational portion or for the social aspect, because they cover both, um, you have more to talk about when you sit down during your job interviews and on your resume saying you did these things. Prior to her actually attending here, when she had mentioned she had been to London before, through Girl Scouts, she did destinations. And she went and traveled um, from, I want to say freshman through junior year, she did a destination each year, and the last one was to London, um, Paris, and Switzerland. And with that, that made a huge difference on even when she went in for her internship um, in engineering, and the company loved her so well, they already given her an offer. From two summers ago, she contact, they contacted her already and said, we want you to come and work for us. So having that experience makes a difference, even if it is within the career or the actual um, degree plan, and see how it can actually be a benefit to be able to give you additional things from there, because it's definitely a life-changing experience. How many weeks is the summer option and you mentioned that the Maymester is a one, three credit course. What about the summer option on the courses? So summers are programs, and so they also vary in credit depending on which program you're doing. Um, some, for example, the DIS program in the summer, you can do just one sort of block in the summer, and that would be normally three but you can do multiple, so you could get as many as nine credits if you're doing you know, the three blocks. So it really depends. Some are going to be a standard five to seven credits or eight. So it really just depends on the summer program. Mr. Gonzalez, did you want to add something? Just with regards to um, the discussions on the internship and once again, how you plan all of that out. Um, you know, I think all of us here are recognize that Vanderbilt is a fairly rigorous university, so uh, our kids go through a very intense uh, academic environment. Uh, so therefore, my perspective on, even on international, you know, it might be easy for you to think, well, you know, wow, I would love that trip myself, right? It's, but it's a little bit more than that. There is, in fact, uh, uh, a lot of... Um, uh, instruction and in, in an academic environment that takes place in just about all the programs that I've seen uh, with Emily's friends uh, that have gone off, whether it be to Spain or to Europe or, or uh, whatnot. Uh, I think that, um, and, and I guess my point is that I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. 
Right. Um, so when you're looking at the, the whole basket of different options in, your, in the four-year experience that your, your child is going to have, um, you should always try to opt for that international experience if you can. Um, and my only caveat to that is, you know, uh, just recognize that what I think, this is my editorial comment on but I think that the, the internship in, in the junior year is probably the most critical internship out of any uh, year, so therefore put, put all of your heart and effort into that uh, decision and, and making sure that your student is, uh, is really active in, in, in the process of, of getting a real quality internship between junior and senior year. Outside of that, you know, try to avail themselves as much as they can to, to all the other great Vanderbilt experiences and certainly in the, the uh, May semester or, or study abroad. Okay, we have one Thank question there, and then Tyler, we have another one when he's done. Thank you for arranging the program. Uh, my question was, uh, what are the costs or the uh, expenses which uh, a student will be responsible for during this uh, study abroad programs? Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier that we charge Vanderbilt tuition because these are Vanderbilt approved programs and the students stay registered at Vanderbilt for the time that they're abroad. Um, so the tuition is going to be the same, whether they're on campus or off. Um, then we have a study abroad administrative fee, which is the same for all students, and that's 250. Um, and then after that is a program fee that varies depending on the program. And the program fee is a pass-through fee. So whatever the program is charging us, um, and that usually includes housing um, and any other sort of non-academic charges, whatever they're charging us, that's what we charge you on the Vanderbilt bill. Um, and as I said, the Vanderbilt um, financial aid, Vanderbilt f scholarships, they apply to the semester programs. So it, you'll be billed by Vanderbilt as you would normally. Tuition will be the same. Um, you won't see Vanderbilt housing or Vanderbilt meal plan. Um, and you should not see the student services fee that they tried to spring on us this year, but we took it off the bill. Um, so the bill will look different, but the tuition will be the same. So again, and what the cost is varies depending on the program. Some programs are going to be more expensive because it's more expensive to live in London, for example, um, and some will be less expensive. Um, so it really just depends, again, what the final cost will be as far as the program fee. That's where you'll see the difference in the cost. Thank you for sharing your experiences. I had a question for the two students that did their experience in the fall. Can you speak to then coming back to the Vanderbilt campus in the spring? And my specific question is around your housing arrangements. And did you experience any challenge in finding a roommate for spring semester? Any difference in that housing experience? Uh, I think my experience might not be applicable to everyone because I was living in a suite when I uh, left to go abroad. and. I happened to have a roommate who was going abroad in the spring, so we sort of switched off rooms and we coordinated with housing to do that. Um, uh, I can't really speak for other housing options, though I know one of my friends who went abroad in the fall came back and uh, found a single room, um, just because it's sort of hard to coordinate that, so I don't know. If you... um, so yeah, it is a little bit interesting coordinating it. Uh, I came back and I uh, had a single, um, but I did have the option to move in with one of my friends who um, was also coming back to uh, Vanderbilt in the spring from studying abroad in Australia. Um, and so I had that, like those two options mainly, um, but also this year, well, yeah, I guess this year, um, Vanderbilt is emphasizing that there is a new um, perk of going abroad in the fall, which is that you are at the top of the housing um, portal and you're like first priority um, if you do that, um, which is a nice benefit because you kind of get a chance to get the good housing. Um, but even with my housing situation, I ended up um, staying in the all girls dorm and that was completely fine um, and super convenient to get to class. <laughs> So, so they're right. So we do have um, incentives for study abroad in the fall, and that includes, I think it's a half point credit in the lottery for the housing, priority registration for courses, and was there something else for the return? What? 
Right, and then there's some financial benefits um, to go. So many of our programs um, will have uh, either a stipend or a voucher for travel um, for students who are going abroad in the fall. It's not all the programs for that, but it is the, the return benefits, those are for all of our fall students. So I wanted to ask, our daughter is a uh, freshman, <clears throat> HOD, so she will have a capstone project already which will take her off campus for a semester. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there's a London option there, but there's also DC, which I think she's ed policy mm -hmm. and a double major in economics. So for a, a kid that's in that situation, is Maymester or summer really the only option or do they still have a regular semester option as well? They can definitely do a semester. We, we have a large number of HOD students who apply for study abroad and who participate in study abroad. Um, mostly the courses that they would take towards uh, the HOD major would be track electives um, for the term that they're abroad. But again, you know, it just depends on what they need to take. Um, and, you know, we ask that students uh, do their best to meet with their academic advisors and review their four-year plan and sort of ask where the flexibility lies in their schedule as far as what can they take early, what can they move um, around and take a different semester if they need to. Um, but most of our students are taking courses towards their major while they're abroad, especially for the, for the semester programs. We believe in the four-year plan unless you're doing a four plus one, um, but yeah. And, and I think in my time here, and I've been in this office since 2001, there's only one student that I know of who did five years, but she had already planned on it. And then, well, and she wasn't doing a four plus one, but then I had others who were doing a four plus one degree. So on that, so is the four plus one for masters? Is that? Yes, so there are, I think, a limited number of majors where you can do that. I think one is computer science, um, and I think another one might be nursing. Don't, I mean, I don't know the full details of that, but I know I've had students who, who've said, well, I need to get these courses because I'm doing this thing later. Okay, okay, okay yeah. thank you. What percentage of students, Vanderbilt students, participate in the study abroad? Um, currently, it's about 45 to 50. Percent? Percent. By the time they will have graduated, they will have studied abroad. I have a question related to uh, GPA. Thank you. <laughs> Our daughter is interested in going to Barcelona mm -hmm. and is going to be studying as if she were a Spanish, regular Spanish student, okay. citizen. And so we were told, and she was led to believe that the GPA, the courses and the credit she would get for it would not uh, go towards her GPA. Is that correct, or is that all specific to programs? And we need to really come see you separately. So, so um, new for starting this fall. Um, the so it's still a, it's a Vanderbilt approved program, but the the grades are not going to factor into their Vanderbilt GPA. They are going to show up on the transcript, the Vanderbilt transcript, as a special study away credit. Um, the grades will be posted on there, um, but they won't be part of the GPA. So if they make all A's, all of the A's will be posted on the transcript. If they don't do as well in everything, then those will also be posted on there, but they won't impact the GPA. And that's a change, because before the grades that they made would factor in, but because of SACS accreditation rules, we had to find a way to continue to allow our students to study abroad um, and receive financial aid. Um, so that was what we were able to come up with. And so for students who are applying to med school, um, well, you guys were direct credit, so never mind. <laughs> but future med school students, the grades will be on there, so, so the, the medical schools will see that and will be able to factor that into the student's overall GPA. So. Thank you. And, and is she a native speaker, writer? She's taking Spanish classes here at uh, Vanderbilt, okay. so I'm sure she's a native speaker. Um. <laughs> no, but she, she actually went to um, Spain several times. She did mm -hmm. a master. She's gone before. Yeah. And she's feeling comfortable, and we okay. want to feel comfortable too, both in terms of her ability, but also in terms of the GPA issue. OK. I, I'm bilingual myself, uh, French and English. My mom is French. Um, one of the things that we find with bilingual students, me included, is that you can go through, because I took French in high school, um, you can go through school and never actually 
learn the grammar because you coast by on your knowledge from speaking your mother or tongue at home. Um, so that's why we always want, that's why I ask to make sure it's like, is the, is she going to be comfortable enough to take classes all in Spanish? Um, which a lot of our students do. It just depends on what subject areas. So if she was an engineer and taking in Spanish, maybe not so much. Yeah. She's good. This will go towards her Spanish minor. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions? Are we doing on time? No? Okay. I want to ask one last question of the students. Um, and it's really sort of more, now that you're back, what did you learn about yourselves when you went abroad? And for the parents, what did you see um, after they returned? Um, so obviously from an academic standpoint, I had that internship and I took a lot of courses and learned a lot that way. Um, but from a more personal standpoint, um, I really learned to reprioritize what's important to me. And in the first couple years of college, I was very, academic and that's the only thing that matters is doing really well in your classes and I did do well in my courses abroad um, but I learned that it's more important to take care of myself mentally and emotionally and you know if I'm having a rough day it's good to go to the beach or spend time outside and you know take a minute and put yourself first rather than your grades so that's what I kind of learned from studying abroad. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, that um, studying abroad was a good way to get away from uh, the stress that you often feel at Vanderbilt, um, you know, with everyone else being stressed around you, it's easy to get into that mindset. So I think going abroad, you know, it taught me to be more independent and reevaluate my priorities and um, learn that, you know, academics isn't the end all be all, you know, there's other things in life. And um, I mentioned earlier that I was a double major and going into study abroad, I was actually um, a neuroscience major with philosophy minor. Uh, but after taking some of my philosophy classes abroad, I decided to declare a major because I enjoyed them so much. So from an academic standpoint, um, I felt like I was able to, you know, further my medical career because of the clinical experience, but also with the second major of philosophy, I was able to develop that interest more. So I think for both academics and from a personal standpoint, um, study abroad really did like change my mindset about a lot of things. Um, from an academic standpoint, I, I learned that I know how to work the Vanderbilt academic system, but I do not know how to work another academic system. Um, and with that, I was able to learn more universal skills for approaching different problems, um, which will be helpful in my career, no matter um, what I go into, because a lot of times you don't have just one way of approaching a problem. You need to look at it um, and like be able to take a step back and like really process what that problem is. Um, which is especially useful in engineering. Um, and then also personally, um, I was able to just branch out and challenge myself in a million ways. Um, I challenged my fears, fear of heights, fear of everything basically, <laughs> um, fear of being away from home for a really long time. I had been away from home for like two weeks at most, but um, being literally on the other side of the world was a challenge in itself. And um, I really appreciated that growth um, that I was able to get from that. And also to be able to reflect on my experiences and just grow as an individual. Um, and whenever I talk to someone about my experience abroad, they can hear the passion in my voice whenever I speak about my experiences and um, everything that I did. Um, and overall, I was just, able to truly like just become a new version of me and um, even like I never really liked the outdoors and I went to New Zealand in the South Island of New Zealand which is like the most outdoorsy place you can ever be besides Australia um, and with that I, my first weekend there at my orientation I got out and started doing a scavenger hunt around with a bunch of cows and sheep and <laughs> also got a chance to hike with that. Um, and then my first weekend in Christchurch, once we finally um, went to our respective cities, I actually went on a hike with 
pretty much just my regular hiking boots that I had just bought. They were brand new. <laughs> um, and I went with friends who I had just met that day who all like had different hiking experiences. And for me, coming from Chicago where everything is flat, um, it was nice to be able to branch out. And so now I always make sure that I go hiking in Nashville and um, also bring my friends with me as well because I know that they don't have a lot of those experiences as well. So yeah. Okay, so um, what I take from the experience, um, there was a few factors that came in place. One, having to have the support from ICSFA. Um, the organization itself, um, I know we didn't kind of play into this as much. Um, I know it's a program and they are a third party, but they are extremely helpful. Um, it was helpful for the fact of having the support, getting communications. I think I had an email once a week um, after he got into the last uh, stretch of maybe uh, 45 days to maybe three months. I don't know. I just knew it was more emails coming in with a lot of information. Of that information, um, my daughter did a lot of research. Um, I did follow through with most of the information itself, but that support was huge. Um, I knew she had support where she went. I didn't have to worry. Um, she's already a go-getter by herself, but knowing that she had that support and as she just stated, she learned a whole lot of different things because you would never catch her outside. Um, that, that started from little on up, up until when she went away to college. So um, she grew, she grew in different areas. She had that support from the university. She had that support from the ESFA organization. And she had our support, there was no question. Because, you know, parents are parents, right? But she had a whole nother family that helped along with the aspects of what was going on. And I didn't have to worry. Uh, they had extra uh, meetings. They made a plan. I didn't even know half of the plan. Um, they met so often that um, when I did go visit, I did get the chance to meet your coordinator because they were having a meeting that week um, on that day. And it was just, wow, it was like there's another mom for her while she was there. With that support, she grew. She already was organizing, but I think she came back organized better because of having two different ways of how the teaching was um, going on at the university there. Uh, sometimes I was like, are you in school? Um, and I said, okay, I need some kind of way to see your grades. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> um, that experience was just you know, overwhelming on my end. Um, the other part is knowing that support was there, I wasn't too worried. And then having to go. Yes, I had to go. I had to go check it out for myself. First of all, I have never been across the country that way. <laughs> I needed to go and check out and see where she's at. When I came back, there was no question. We hardly talked. Oh, by the way, when you have um, study abroad, WhatsApp. Put that on your phone. If anyone knows about WhatsApp, <laughs> put it on your phone. Because we got a chance to be able to at least videotape each other. Wasn't worried about communication. Um, just a lot of different things. The last thing I want to say is that for education-wise, I felt really, really great about what she learned. Um, for that being a country that is being rebuilt, I didn't even realize that their civil engineering department at that university was top and part of their recommitment to building their school, or not the school, but the area. And then the last thing, I didn't realize that she had connected so well with her um, friends. Some of you all know that um, there was a situation in Christchurch and I didn't know she was mourning here about her friends over in Christchurch until one day we were discussing it and she had mentioned, Ma, I need to take some time to reflect with my connections there and how 
my friends there, they're safe, but their family, some of them were affected, as she was affected by what was happening there for herself. That's strong. That's a strong commitment after taking that knowledge and going for it. Thank you. Okay. So, well, we, we're, we're a little over time. Do you have, are you good? Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, Mrs. Baker, Cyan, Yuchi, and Julia. Thank you so much. And thank you. We do have an open house from 1 to 3 in Suite 103 of the Student Life Center. You can come back and have more in-depth conversations with us.